Good morning. It's good to see you all here and uh, thankful for the beautiful weather and it's great to see the conversations taking place this morning. Uh, I'm glad each of you can be here and if, uh, for those who are maybe joining online, I'm glad you're with us as well. Just a few quick announcements this morning. Uh, all, most of these are in the bulletin, but remember the business meeting this, sun, uh, excuse me, this coming Wednesday at 630, we'll be discussing the uh, changes to the Constitution and bylaws, those revisions. And as you exit today, if you haven't yet picked up a copy of those, um, there will be some copies available for you to review before Wednesday. Uh, remember the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We want to be able to give to this. Uh, God has blessed us so richly. And just a small portion of what we can give back, that's what we should be doing to support North American missions. Uh, the United States uh, is not the country that it has been in the past. So missionaries are needed in all areas. So I'm thankful that we can support that. Uh, there's a information about an upcoming women's retreat in the bulletin. Ladies, take a look at that. Uh, thankful that Dr. John Ewart is with us today. He was with us last year. Uh, and the Keithleys, they're traveling. Uh, God's using them in another country over the next eight or ten days. And so we're thankful that he can be here. Uh, here with us today and remember next Saturday evening time change um, probably most people are not looking forward to losing that hour but I am because that means my kids are going to sleep one hour longer in the morning <laughs> I will I will gladly sacrifice an hour if they get an extra one so uh, the last thing this uh, this morning is going through our prayer guide as we're praying and, and supporting the pastor search committee and today uh, we're in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 19 through verse 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filled all in all. As we pray today, let's pray for our future, future pastor to grow in wisdom and knowledge of Christ and that we as the church uh, will look to Christ as the head of the body. Join me in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to be here Lord, to be with the fellow believers, Lord, we know that uh, those of us who are believers here today, Lord, that we are the church. Lord, it's not this building, Lord, and, and the head of the church is you, Jesus Christ. God, I pray uh, for the pastor that you will call to lead us, Lord, who will be the under-shepherd under you, Jesus Christ. Lord, that you will prepare him, Lord, prepare him the knowledge and wisdom of you, Lord, that he will be searching for you, for your will, for him and his life. God, I thank you that you are so faithful to us. Lord, as we worship together today, Lord, we know that you are the audience. Lord, worship is not for us, but it is for us to proclaim and return thanks and glory to you. Lord, I pray that you'll be pleased in the way that we conduct ourselves. Lord, thank you for Dr. Ewart being with us. Lord, I pray that you'll bless him. Lord, I pray that you will use uh, the words that he has, and Lord, the Holy Spirit will apply those to our lives, Lord, and that we will lead here a change of people. It's in your son's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, KMBC kids. I have a calendar with me, and I don't know if you can tell it or not, but this calendar is from the year 2000. It's kind of a long time ago, isn't it? You know, calendars are really cool and a really useful tool. We keep track of all sorts of things on them. When holidays are, fun activities that we're going to do, birthdays, we may even mark when a vacation's going to be. Sometimes we have to keep track of unpleasant things like a doctor's appointment or a dentist trip, but they help us to remember when things happen. Unless, of course, it's an expired calendar, kind of like this one. You know, it wouldn't do me much good to put meetings that I have or events that are coming up on this calendar because I get the days all wrong. I might show up on the right date but the wrong day or the wrong day but the right date. I'd never be in the right place at the right time. 
And you know, as helpful as calendars can be, they also make me think of something else. You know, I wouldn't put my current events, things that I need to keep track of and know that are coming up on this calendar, but yet quite often we hold on to our past mis mistakes and past sins as though they're going to do us some good, as though we might be able to change them. We have those memories and sometimes we don't let go of them. But you know what? If we are a believer in Christ, if we have said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, please forgive me of my sins, we don't have to hold on to those sins and mistakes like they're some old expired calendar that really is no good anymore. Because you see in Psalm 103 and verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, he has taken our transgressions from us. So boys and girls, that means when we become Christ followers, when we give our hearts and lives to Jesus and say, I'm yours, use me, he takes away our sin and we don't have to remember them anymore. Learn from the mistakes and learn the lessons that come along with them, but we don't have to keep digging them up and thinking about them. So as we look at calendars and we think about what's to come, I hope we'll use those to remind us to give our sins and mistakes to Jesus so that we can keep looking forward to what is it he wants to do with us, how is it he wants to use us, rather than looking back and hanging on to things we can't undo and we can't change. So boys and girls, I hope you have a great week this week, and until next time, God bless. All right, amen and good morning. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to start off our service with a song just about how his mercy is more. And I'm glad that his mercy is more than my failures, my sins, and my mistakes, because if it weren't, I would be lost, and so would you. So let's praise him this morning.
thankful for that this morning? I know I am. All right, come on and help us out. Here we go. All my shame was met with mercy, and now your mercy will be my song. beautiful day the Lord's made for us this morning and uh, we've got these young folks just up here with us and all you know isn't it a blessing to have as many you know we normally would only have six to help and but I'm not going to turn any down that wants to help to be able to uh, help out with the church and the Lord's business and um, I just want to uh, let you know how, how proud I am of these young men and, and women both that are willing to help us and step up and pray and uh, you know, it's a big undertaking standing in front of a congregation, church, a lot of folks to, to do this. And uh, just want to lift them up, if y'all will, in prayer as well. Lord, we thank you for this day and thank you for everything that you've done. And thank you for blessing us today and being able to worship you. And we thank you for coming into your house and being able to worship you today. Amen. Special for you this morning. Uh, this is going to be a new song we're going to be kicking off. Uh, we're going to do it as the special this morning, but y'all are going to do it coming up soon. This is our new song for Easter. It's called Resurrecting. The hand that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior Your name, your name. 
church. It's good to be back in Kinley. You know, I live in Roseville, America, and the fastest route between Roseville and Kinley is not a straight line. Let me tell you something. It's one of those things where you have to watch every second, you know, and, and, and 0.3 miles you're going to turn right, and 1.4 miles you're going to turn left, and it just keeps going all the way here. Now, there's a, a longer way to get there from here, but a uh, straighter way, but uh, uh, I get to see a lot of country, I feel like, and you have to pay attention to get here. Uh, Dr. Keithley and Penny, they are in Rio, Brazil, uh, working with some of our uh, great, great Baptist partners down there. Uh, they're dear friends of mine uh, as well. I'm in Brazil at least once or twice a year, and uh, they're working at the uh, seminary there. He's doing a lecture series at the seminary there and uh, in Rio, <clears throat> and also uh, we'll be helping some with the National Mission Board there while he's there. And so you be in prayer for them. Also, if you don't mind, if you'll continue to pray for our friends in the Ukraine, uh, this is not a news story to us. Uh, we have friends uh, that we're talking to daily uh, there uh, on the ground. Uh, I was supposed to be in Ukraine two weeks ago to teach them and uh, obviously did not go. We taught online, but, and I'm supposed to be back there in a couple of months to do their graduation. So we have a master's level training partnership with the seminary that we do down there working with a seminary there and that seminary has turned into a refugee center where they're processing hundreds and hundreds of people a day uh, mostly women and children uh, as they're trying to get to safety so uh, I know that you're watching those stories and uh, for us these are these are daily experiences with real friends so just appreciate your prayers uh, for the Ukraine and I appreciate so much your desire and your your efforts in giving to Annie Armstrong uh, as mentioned, the United States of America is in desperate need of a church that is strong. We need, we need thousands of new churches planted every year just to keep up with the closures of churches. Uh, dozens of churches close their doors uh, in the United States of America for the last time every week. And so we need, we need church planting and evangelism in a mighty way. And that's what Annie Armstrong would go to support. So I appreciate that. As a missiologist, I have to say these things. 
Uh, my degree is in missions. I teach missions at the seminary. And of course, I travel all over the world. In the next six months, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be in the Philippines. Then I'll be in Korea. Then I'll be in Japan. Uh, then I'm supposed to go to Ukraine. We'll see. Then I'm supposed to be in Brazil myself. And then I'll be back in Africa again all in the next six or seven months or so. So I appreciate you all and your prayers. Also praying for you. Dr. Keith Lee and I talk about you often. We meet on a regular basis at the seminary as we work together on the same team. And uh, we're talking about you, and I'm praying for you and your pastor search process. I know you are as well. But let's talk about God on mission for a moment. Take your Bibles. We're going to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 9 and 10. So turn to Matthew 9. We'll be at the end of that chapter. We'll move into the first verses of chapter 10 uh, as, uh, as we talk about this God uh, on mission. Uh, I believe in a very sovereign God who is searching for those who will join him uh, on behalf of the nations. And uh, he is on mission to redeem the nations. We know that throughout Scripture. That's the, the, the story of all the Bible. Uh, we know that the end game is Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 7, when we'll see people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation in a throne room worshiping him. Part of what I'm trying to do, and I know you are too, is to help move that along so that we can see as many people there uh, as possible. Uh, Those from Kinley, those from Roseville, those from Brazil, those from Ukraine, those from Africa, etc. And so as we work together, we'll do that. And so God's on mission, and he's looking for a people to join him on his mission. And a church that's called a Missionary Baptist Church better be well aware of what that means. And I know that as you're looking forward to your next pastor, you're going to be looking at how your leadership can guide you into fulfilling this mission even more. So in a passage of scripture that I'm sure you've heard taught or taught yourself or preached concerning before uh, now, uh, I want us to walk through this very carefully. Uh, We won't look at too many verses. We're going to look at them very carefully and specifically though, beginning in Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. Um, I'm going to read out of the the ESV version, uh, although you will notice as we walk through this passage that your translations will have different words, and I'm going to talk about that as we walk through this together. Matthew 9, 35 says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. So one of the things that we see is he's He's doing a couple of different things. Uh, He's traveling about at this point in his ministry, going to all the cities. So he's hitting a lot of villages and cities. It's a summary verse. But we also recognize that he's doing a couple things. He's he's teaching about the kingdom of God, proclaiming the gospel. And he's also healing people physically and spiritually. And if we're going to join him on mission, this verse is one that we don't want to just, just pass over too quickly. Uh, this is kind of a summary verse. As you're, if you're reading through Matthew, you might say, okay, what's the next story? Well, don't do that. Stop in these summary verses and make sure there aren't some lessons to be learned even in these summary verses. Because the first lesson we need to recognize, if we're going to join God on his mission, we must recognize the Christ. We have to recognize Jesus for who he is. And this verse gives us indication of who Jesus really is. There's a lot of what we would call Christological truth here. Uh, the doctrine of Christ. We would see who he is. Um, this, this verse is, the, in, in its summary, is the very heart of Jesus as he proclaims the good news. And that good news is, is that he himself has indeed come. That he is the Messiah and that he has come. But he's also teaching, and you'll know in his teachings about in parables and in other ways, he's constantly talking about the kingdom of God is like So you assume that some of this content would be similar. So he's teaching about the kingdom. And one of the things that he does, if you'll notice that the last part of that verse, he's healing every disease and every affliction. Don't miss those powerful words, every. Uh, This is not just a few. There's not something that he can't do. There's there's not some disease that's bigger than he is. There's not some demon greater than he is. There's not some affliction that he can't handle. He's able to heal every disease and every affliction. This is a statement about who this really is. This isn't just some rabbi. This isn't just some good teacher. Because here we see him demonstrating... His complete authority over creation. 
we see a demonstration of authority. Remember I said that because toward the end of the sermon, I'm going to remind you of that demonstration. So he demonstrates his authority. Now, because who has the authority to do this? Who has the authority to heal every disease and every affliction? Who has the authority over every bacteria and virus? Who has authority over every molecule and atom? This isn't just a good teacher traveling from city to city. This is, in fact, the Creator God incarnate. Jesus is God Himself in the flesh. And He's demonstrating His authority over the creation that He Himself created. And so we see that He is indeed the Messiah. Now, you stay in Matthew, but let me just... Just show you, and it probably will be on the screen here. Let me just show you this. In John chapter 20, at the end of John 20, verses 30 and 31, remember, there's, there's some, some lessons here. It tells us, why did he do miracles? Why did he do these things? John helps us with this. And he says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So He did these things as a testimony. These signs and wonders weren't just because He loved people, although I'm going to show you in a moment how much He loved people. He did these things as an indication of His identity. This is who I am. We have to recognize that. You're not going to be a part of what God has for your life. You're not going to be a part of His mission. You're not going to be a part of His purpose. You're not going to be a part of His plan if you don't recognize who Jesus really is. You have to trust in Him as Lord and Savior. You have to believe in Him as Messiah or you're never going to get on board this train. You're never going to be a part of what God really has for you, which is the most powerful, abundant life possible. Right? He created you for that. So he went to them. Notice this. Jesus is going to them to meet real needs. It's a very holistic idea as well. He's healing physically. He's healing spiritually. He re- he's revealing his authority and power. And we're going to see in a moment his love. So how do, we, how do we share in this? How do we get to be a part of this? Well, let's keep going. Look at verse 36. comes right after verse 35. So let's go to verse 36. Make sense? Here we go. That's how the Word of God was written. In verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. I don't know if every translation, most translations will say compassion. Had compassion for them, and this is where it's going to start getting different. The ESV says, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, your translation might say something else. It might say they were weary and scattered, for example. That's one translation. And and what we're going to see here is that the language English is struggling with the original Greek. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, about what these words really mean and how powerful they are. But, But to join God on His mission, we have to recognize that Christ, and then secondly, we have to react with compassion. If we don't have His heart, if we don't have the heart of Christ, we're we're not going to be a part of this. I teach evangelism virtually every semester at the seminary. I teach missions virtually every semester at the seminary on both the the college level, the master's level, and the doctoral level. And, And I tell every one of those levels, and all around the world when I'm teaching these things, if you don't care, you're not going to share. (laughs) Right? You're just not. It's just not going to be there. It's not going to be a part of who you are. You're not going to have that motivation. You're not going to have that drive to be a part of something bigger than yourself because you're going to be more focused upon yourself probably. So it says that he reacted with compassion. See, He sees these crowds, and the word for crowd there means big crowd. So you got to think, and this is when the multitudes, that would be a good word, this is when the multitudes were still following him, thousands of people, right? And so this is a large crowd of people. And I don't know exactly where it happened, but I always imagine him kind of sitting up on a little bit of a hill or a little knoll, and here's this mass of humanity out there with sick people and hurt people and broken people. And he's looking out with his disciples around him, and he reacts with this word, compassion, splagidsomai in the Greek. We get our English word spleen from this word. 
And it's the, the, the Greek language is much more specific than English. So you could have more than one word for compassion. You would have more than one word for sympathy. You'd have more than one word for empathy. And this is the deepest word for compassion that you can muster up in this very specific language. It, and it refers to the guts. That's why we get the word from it. Because in the biblical times, the seat of emotion wasn't your heart. That's a Western thing that came much later for Valentine's Day, I think, to sell cards. But anyway, but, but, but the seat of emotions in the Bible, it was the guts. And so you would have a gut level, literally a gut level reaction to what you were seeing or what you were feeling. And it's the deepest word for sympathy or pity that you can get. It it's, goes to the deepest level of who you are. I, Jesus is literally sick to his stomach and has a gut-wrenching reaction to the lostness and the brokenness of the creation that he sees before him. If anybody ever tells you that God doesn't love sinners and God doesn't love the lost, they're not reading the Bible correctly. Because this verse is very clear. He, he loves us at the depths of his being. He loves this world at the depths of his being. It's a gut-wrenching reaction. Uh, years ago, I, uh, uh, I've been to Africa, I don't know how many times, but, but uh, Malawi many, many times. Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the, on the planet. Uh, it's even poor in African terms. And uh, when I was a full-time pastor, uh, we used to do some medical missions and construction and different things. We'd take big teams over, and uh, we could run through a million-dollar pharmacy in four days and be done with it, you know, and things. And so we, we would have thousands of people lined up for help. And uh, part of my job each time was to shut down the clinics every day. We'd take over a whole school compound, and there'd be different doctors and eye doctors and dentists and we even had chiropractors. They, they were very popular. Um, uh, all these women carrying water jugs on their necks. Uh, I, I, when I first took a chiropractor overseas, I'm like, what are you? I'm not sure what you're going to... Culturally, I wasn't sure how this was going to work. Man, those ladies were lined up. He could have been the chief of any village. I'm telling you, because they come, their necks were killing them from carrying that water and carrying that stuff on their heads. And they come out of there feeling, feeling so much better, you know. And, uh, and so it's just a sea of people. And, uh, and I, I was managing all that. And so part of my job was to stand on a platform at the end of the day and say, we're, we're shutting down for the day. We'll be back tomorrow. We had a numbering system for people and whatnot. Uh, and, and, of course, our ultimate goal was not the physical healing, although we knew that it was helpful. Our ultimate goal is we're also sharing the gospel. We're working with local churches, working with a local Bible school who'd follow up on people, trying to do it right. Well, then you come to the last day. And it's the last day of the last day. And you still have hundreds of people lined up. And you're basically out of medicine. You're basically out of stuff. And we got to get to the airport. And we'll work until we're really too late even to get to the airport. And so at that point, I, I get everybody else out because it can get a little dicey, frankly. And so I get everybody else out. And I, I remember the day. It's me standing there and a, a national pastor and a missionary. And it's up to me because I'm the bigger one. Uh, it's up to me to shut down the clinic. And as I'm telling people this, I could hear her screaming. I couldn't see her at first, but I could hear her screaming. She was in the back. But nothing was going to stop her. She was throwing elbows and shoulders, and, and, the, and this, people were just parting to get out of her way, and she made her way to my feet. She couldn't have weighed 80 pounds herself, and she was holding a little baby in her arms that weighed far less. And she says, no, my baby has to see a doctor. My baby has to see a doctor or he'll die. And I had to explain to her that the doctors were already gone and that there was no one left to see her, but that maybe these men could try to help her in some way. And she screamed, no. Then I'll never forget the moment she held up her son and she says, then you must take my son with you. That's his only chance. And I couldn't do that and I had to try to explain that to her and I followed up later and the missionaries and the pastor were trying to follow up with her and that baby indeed died two days later now see if something like that didn't pull on your heart I don't know where your heart is you know but, but friends I, I mean this to say that you you don't have to go a quarter of a mile 
to find somebody who's just as sick spiritually and just as dead spiritually as that baby. And our heart needs to go that direction too. Not instead of, but too. And if we don't have that level of compassion... And, and so in these verses, there's really strong, vivid language used in the original language. There's some, some professors who are long dead now who are Greek scholars, and in their commentaries, they really bring this imagery out. And, and, and one of the, the, the things you've got to understand is that first word, however it's translated for you, for me it was harassed, it might be weary for you, but that first word of the two words of the ands, that first word can mean to mangle it can mean to plunder. The image is a corpse being torn apart by wild animals. It can be a very violent word. And our English just doesn't pull that out very well. And, and the fact that, that English is struggling in different translations with different words, we need a paragraph for that one word in English. But it can refer to a dead body being torn apart. Think, think, of, think of a dead body being torn apart by wolves. And, and in fact, one commentator even believes that's the imagery here because of the lamb in imagery that's not only in these verses, but it's before and after in, in Matthew. And so there's this, this sheep imagery going on here. So think of a lamb being torn apart by a pack of wolves. That's what that first word means. And then the second word, helpless, scattered, dispirited, it means to be hit so hard that you're thrown down with mortal wounds and you can't get up by yourself. It's an incredible picture of lostness. I cannot save myself. Sin hits me so hard that I'm down and I can't get up by myself. And that's the image of this crowd. And the way it's written is it's happening over. It's thorough and it's persistent. They're being torn apart and knocked down, torn apart and knocked down, and torn apart and knocked down. And that's what lostness does. That's what this fallen creation does. That's what sin in this world does. And Jesus, the creator God incarnate, looks at that and he's nauseated. This is not how it was supposed to have been in Eden. And he's come to restore. And so... He's in this state, I think, of agitation. And, 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 and so there's this world. There's this world that's hurting so much. Beaten down and ripped apart continuously. Why? Because they're sheep without a shepherd. Do, do you know what sheep without a shepherd are? Dead. That's what they are. I used to raise cattle. I've been... On, worked for a couple of different cattle ranches. I'm originally from Oklahoma, several years in the international country of Texas as well. Uh, my first foreign missionary journey uh, was to Texas. Uh, when you're from Oklahoma, that really makes sense. Uh, but, uh, and, and so I've worked on both mixed breed and purebred cattle situations. Don't do it anymore. My relatives still do. But, but I don't know that much about sheep, but I've studied them because of this passage. And, and my understanding of sheep is, is that they'll die of thirst a hundred yards from water. I mean, they need somebody to guide them. And they need somebody to protect them. Sheep, I believe, were created to be food. That's why they're here. Uh, and without a shepherd to guide them and protect them, somebody's going to get them. I mean, one of the, Tom Elliff, the former president of the International Mission Board, was preaching this passage one time. He says, here's a headline you'll never hear. Flock of sheep rampage village. You'll just never hear that. They're never going to get together that much. They're not that organized. They're just not going to do it. So they're unable to rescue themselves. They're unable to guard themselves. They need someone who will feed them, someone who will comfort them, someone who will guide them. And Jesus is literally sickened by it because he sees beyond just the physical to the deeper tragedy of these people's souls. And I, and I just have to ask the church every time I share this passage, and I teach this passage every semester in class to students because I want them to get it. And I have to ask people, I, I have to ask churches, when you see the humanity around you, what do you feel? When was the last time you mourned over a lost soul? When was the last time you were sick to your stomach because your neighbor or your coworker or your classmate didn't know Jesus? When was the last time you had to go in the prayer closet and just weep over the lostness 
of somebody in your world. Because they're, they're being beaten down. They're being ripped apart by their lostness. So the way for us to join God on his mission to reach the nations is we have to recognize the Christ. Then we have to have his heart. We've got to react with compassion. But look at verse 37. It comes next. Amazing. Here it is. Then he said to his disciples, right after this, right after this gut-wrenching reaction, then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. See, the third thing we have to do is you have to realize the crisis. There's a crisis. See, there's nothing wrong with the harvest. That's not the problem. The the harvest is just fine. Uh, In fact, the word plentiful, we get our English word pollution from this. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You don't have to look for it. You can smell the harvest. It's all over the place. The harvest is everywhere. I don't have to look hard to find lost people. I don't have to look hard to find hurting people. I don't have to look hard to find broken people in relationships. It's everywhere. And so Jesus saw these hurting people as a harvest. It's like fruit ripe for the picking, right? And he wants his disciples to be awakened to their state of being. The religious leaders didn't care. The religious leaders would see him like chaff to be burned or to be discarded or ignored. But Jesus says, you can't be this way. That's not what the kingdom is about. The kingdom is about these people and reaching out to them. You know, we, we have, this is one of the most prophetic statements that Jesus could ever utter, by the way. Right now in the United States of America, this is not a guess, this is what I do for a living. In the United States of America, over 90% of, our, of the active church members of Southern Baptist churches will never share their faith. The workers are few. Billions of people in the world. That's hard. Those are hard numbers, aren't they? You hear that at Lottie Moon time? Billions of lost, thousands of unreached people groups. Hard to wrap your heads around that. You need to know somebody. Somebody in your life. Somebody across the street. But thousands of people around the world with no access to the gospel. Uh, And I don't know if you understand that 94% of American churches are growing slower than the population rates around them. And so we're losing ground. The problem's not the harvest. The problem is, is the church, the workers, are not engaging in the harvest in the right way. There is a crisis that has to be acknowledged. We have to realize this. We have to realize the truth. We have to acknowledge it. Jesus sees them as a precious harvest to be reaped and saved. I mentioned cattle. Let me, I'll tell you this story. This, you'll like this story. So we, when I, I lived in Waco, Texas, and I worked... Uh, part-time on a ranch that was a subsidiary of the King's Ranch. Some of you are probably driving King's Ranch edition pickup trucks out there. And the King's Ranch is actually a huge ranch down in Texas. It's about the size of Rhode Island. It's massive. It's one of the largest private land ownerships in the United States of America. And this was a subsidiary that was in the scientific business of perfecting the Santa Gertrudis breed of bull. Santa Gertrudis is a breed of cow. It looks like a Brahma, has the big hump on it. And it's all, they all look exactly alike. They're all reddish brown. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, but it's like raising thoroughbred horses. Uh, we, we had bulls, and this is a long time ago. We had bulls insured for over a million dollars. I mean, these are vi- every one of these animals is thousands and thousands of dollars as you try and perfect the perfect, the perfect Santa Gertrudis bull, right? I lived out at the ranch house. Part of my job was security, and we'd work the cows in the pens, and Let's say that I was supposed to have 100 bulls. And I wake up one morning and I have 99 bulls. Well, I didn't get to go back to sleep. I had to get out on the horse or a four-wheeler. I had to get the cattle dogs out. And we had to look. Sometimes I'd look all day long. I'd find that stupid calf in the middle of that pond up to, in, in mud. I'd be up to my chest in the, in, the, in the junk pulling that calf out of there to get him out of there to get him home. Now, we could have had the attitude. Now, listen to what I'm about to say. Could have had the attitude of, well, those dumb bulls, they know where the barn is. Got a big sign on it, it says barn. And they know where the hay and the feed is. If they want what we have, they'll come get it. Does that sound familiar? I know churches like that put themselves right on a highway with a big sign, say the same things. But that bull's not coming. He's stuck down there. Or he's too dumb to come. He's ignorant of his need to be at the barn. He doesn't know he's supposed to be at the barn. 
you got to go get him. Seems like there's verses about that, about leaving the 99. These are precious people, every one of them. Every inactive church member, precious. Every lost person, precious. Every active member, precious. That's how we need to treat them. We've got to recognize the Christ. We've got to react with compassion. We've got to also realize the crisis. But look at verse 38. Amazingly, verse 38's next. It's great. The Word of God's great. Have numbers and everything. It says, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Wow. So the next thing we've got to do, number four, is resume the cry. We've got to cry out to God. Part of our responsibility, part of it, not all of it, but part of it, is to pray fervently for more people to go and share in the labor of the harvest. We should beseech or therefore pray earnestly, depends on your translation. And that word means to pray for a particular need, not some general thing, but we're praying by name, we're praying for people, we're praying for specifics, and we're doing it consistently and persistently. It means something. And what are we praying? We're praying that the Lord of the harvest, note the ownership, I don't own the harvest. I can't save people. God has to save them. But I can point them to him, and I can talk about him. I can testify. Lord of the harvest, what do, what do we want him to do? To send out laborers. Now, again, the, the strong language doesn't stop. The, the verb send out, echbalo, is not some gentle whisper. It's not a little gentle thing on the wind when you feel like it, when your emotional state's just fine and you feel good enough to go share the God. That's not what this verse means. This verse means to pick up and to throw. <laughs> it means to push. It means to coerce. It means to kick. It means that we're asking God to pick us up by the scruff of our necks and throw us right into the middle of the harvest. I dare churches to pray that way. I dare Sunday school classes to pray that way. I dare for church staffs to pray that way. I dare elder bodies to pray that way. Because most of them aren't. We don't pray that way for one another. That God would empower you and me and push us. Not let us sleep at night. Not let us be comfortable. Not let us relax until we were engaged in his mission. I dare churches all around the world to pray this way. It'd change everything. To drive us out into that. Because God may have to push us or force us into obedience sometimes. Especially when we resist. Some of us need a fire lit under us. And to be pushed out into the world of real need. So these words are also written in, in, in a, such a sense in the Greek that it's with a sense of urgency. This needs to be done now. Pray this way Now. Jesus is looking at his disciples. You pray this way now. Are you praying that way? Is it urgent to you? An urgent prayer is part of the answer to the labor force crisis as we acknowledge the Lord of the harvest. It would be interesting. It would be interesting if that's where the story stopped. Now, that's the end of the chapter, so it means that well, it must be the end of the sermon. And good grief, look at the time. This guy just won't be quiet. So, but listen to me. Here's what's amazing. Matthew chapter 10 comes right after Matthew chapter 9. Isn't that something? And you know those numbers got added later. There's no doubt that the beginning of chapter 10 is a continuation of this story. So when you're reading your Bible, don't just go by the numbers. Go by the context, Right? So he says, listen, we've got to recognize the Christ if we're going to join his mission. We've got to react with compassion if we're going to join his mission. We've got to realize there's a crisis to be a part of this. We've got to resume the cry. And finally, number, uh, finally, we need to see, we need to respond to his commission. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. I think I skipped a number 5, but anyway, there we go. This is just number 5. I think the Roman numeral's wrong. That's my fault. Can't count in, can't count in Roman I wonder how many times I've done that. So in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and it says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Does this language sound familiar? Does this, does this language ought to sound familiar. Remember verse 35? Yeah, don't, don't lose that. Go on to verse 5. He just he names the disciples. Look at verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying. Give without pay. So he says, listen, don't just pray about it. You've got to act on it. It's not enough just to pray about it. You, you are supposed to pray about it. But you're also supposed to engage in the mission itself and respond to his commission. He says, when we pray for them, we better also pray for ourselves <laughs> and pray that I too would go. Because notice what he does. He sends them out in verse 5. Just like in verse 38, that's the prayer, isn't it? Pray that God would send out these laborers. And then look at chapter 10, verse 5. He, God sends out the laborers. He's answering his own cry for prayer. And the word used here is the word for apostle. And so the ones that are sent out by another. And he commands them to go and do exactly what he had been doing. Notice what he says. Go do exactly what I was showing you back in verse 35. I've been showing you this and showing you this and modeling this for you and demonstrating my authority. Now I'm delegating my authority to you for you to go and continue what I've shown you to do. And it continues to us. It's been passed down to us, the church. So when you compare these verses, you see the demonstration, then the delegation. And right here, it's a Jewish ministry just because of the timing of things. But then if, the beautiful thing about Matthew is you've got Matthew 28. And at the end of the, the book, he goes in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. He says, now the eleven uh, disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. It's not just a Jewish ministry anymore. Go to all the peoples, pantata ethne, all the different ethnicities, all the different peoples groups of the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. To the end of the age. So it's the only way it works, by the way. The only way the Great Commission works, I call it the book in the Great Commission, the only way the Great Commission works is because of His power and His presence. Without His power and His presence, all the going and the baptizing and the teaching in the middle, it won't work. Because He's the Lord of the harvest. But because He has all the power and He's delegating it to us, and His presence in the Holy Spirit is going to be with us wherever we go, because of those two pieces, it actually works. And you can actually share the gospel with somebody. You can actually testify about Jesus, and they could actually be saved. It's amazing. So the disciples were called out to go. So are we. And I promise you the fields are white and ripe for harvest all around Kenley, and all around the world. So we don't just sit there. We've got to do what he wants us to do. A thousand years ago, I worked for what was then called the Foreign Mission Board before it became fancy, and it's called the International Mission Board. And I lived in the Philippines and served there. And we were planting churches and sharing the gospel and even though I lived in Manila, we were working on a little island called Mindoro. Not Mindanao, for those who know the Philippines, but Mindoro, a little bitty island not far off the coast of Luzon. And the only way to get to Mindoro was by ferry in those days, probably still is, little bitty island. And we'd been working for months to set up a meeting. And this is before the internet, before cell phones. I mean, we're talking snail mail and old phone calls. You used to actually have wires that you made phone calls on. And, and there was a group going to meet us there, and we were going to have a big meeting, and we were going to start a church in a little fishing village called Pili. Well, we, we, in those days, it was pretty rough. I was there when Marcos got there. I was there for the revolution when Marcos got booted out of the country. I lived in Manila through the revolution under a table part of the time. And uh, so getting anywhere was, took a long time, roadblocks, all kinds of stuff. So we get to where the boats were, and we can see the last boat going. We missed it. Golly, we missed it. We weren't sure what we were going to do. Uh, our only thought was, I guess, let's have to sleep in the car and wait till morning because there really wasn't anywhere to go. It's not like you can check in at the Holiday Inn or anything around there. 
And, and, and so we were sitting there watching it go, because these were big ferries. You drive your cars on. They probably still use them. Every now and then you hear about one of them capsizing in the Philippines, probably the same boat. And so a little Filipino man comes walking up to us and says, you need to get to Mindoro. We said, we sure do. He says, well, I've got a ferry over here. Well, we'd never been over there. We'd always been right here. <laughs> so we drove over there with him, and he had a little people ferry. Sure enough, he did. It was a little people ferry. And it had a little gangplank you walk over there. If you ever seen the movie African Queen, it was a little bigger than that, not much. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, oh, we, we got to have our car with us when we get to Mindoro because we've got to... We still got to drive. He goes, no problem. We'll get your car on board. So they basically lay two two-by-sixes between the edge of the dock and the edge of the boat. And he smiles real big and says, drive on. <laughs> well, the guy who had been driving your Lottie Moon Purchase vehicle threw me the keys and said, drive on. <laughs> so I got in the car, and it's a manual transmission. So I'm, I'm working my clutch and my gears. And I edge out toward the edge of the dock. Well, the boat was lower than the dock. So all I could see was the top of the boat. And the sea was getting, as the day goes on, it gets rougher and rougher. So all I could really see was the little tower and the antennas of the boat every now and then coming up. And and I couldn't see the boards. So I rolled the window down in my calm voice and screamed like a middle school girl, I can't see the boards. (laughs) No problem. He smiles real big. He hops out on the boards. So now all I see is a, a Filipino man from about the chest up doing this number to me. So I start edging out on those boards. You can hear the boards creaking and bending as I'm doing this. So I'm sitting there and he's doing, I'm, I, I am not exaggerating. He's doing this, he does that, he does that, and halfway through he does this. I never forget stopping halfway through those boards going up and down and I had this very clear thought in my mind. My mother is not going to understand why I died this way. (laughs) I mean, that's exactly what I was like thinking. He continues to guide me. He gets me on the boat. He puts other cars on the boat. I mean, they're, anyway, it's amazing. Little tires, he'd slide them. uh, Anyway, and on the way down, there's about a two-hour boat ride. On the way down there, I'm talking to him as captain of the boat. And he goes, you know, I do this for a living. I wait till the last ferry goes, and then I get all you people to Mindoro. I mean, he's going all day long, but he also does this because he can take people. And he goes, it's always funny to watch you. You can tell when nobody's done it before. But listen to what he said. All you have to do is exactly what I tell you. We got to Mindoro. I had to drive up the boards to get off. Peely Baptist Church is there today. I have a painting over my fireplace, the most prominent place in our home we could display it, of a watercolor of a little hut of a Filipino fishing village that represents Pili Baptist Church to me. But I thought about what he said. You know, when I was on those boards and I was gripping that steering wheel and that you know, gear shift, I wasn't sitting there thinking, you know, I wonder what's on the radio. Or look at that pretty seagull. Or I wonder what I look like in the mirror. I mean, I was zeroed in. And if he said, come forward, I inched forward. And if he said, move to the right, I moved to the right. And if he said, move to the left, I moved to the left. And when he said, stop, I didn't roll my window down and argue with him. I just stopped. I wish I could live my life that way. You know, here's the deal. We can't see the boards. You don't know what's going to happen to you five minutes from now. You have no idea what tomorrow holds. You have no idea what this afternoon is going to bring. You don't know how much time that lost neighbor has. You don't know how much time that broken person in your life has. But he does. And he's laid out the boards. And he can see our tires. And he can see those boards. He knows exactly where we are. And if we'll just listen to him, he'll tell us when to move. And when to stop. If will join him on this mission. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, that you have laid out boards for us to follow. And that, Father, if we'll just be focused on you and not ourselves. And, Father, there's no, no telling what all you could accomplish through us. And, Father, we recognize it's never us. You're the Lord of the harvest. You own it all. It's all you. And so, Father, all we want to do is bring you glory. 
Father, I thank you for this dear church and just pray, Lord, that you would continue to use them and bless them as they give and as they pray, as they seek new leadership, Father. That, Lord, you would show them exactly when to go to the right and when to go to the left and when to move forward and when to stop. And that, Father, we would simply be focused on you and not what's in the mirror. Father, maybe there's someone here this morning, and as we've shared through Matthew, they recognize that they've never taken that first step. They've never recognized the Christ. They've never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so right now, Father, I pray that you would just pierce their heart and mind with the truth of who you are and what you've done. The fact that Jesus really did die on the cross to pay for our sins. And that through him is the only way we can be saved. And Father, I pray that in a moment when we begin to sing, that Father, maybe someone here who wants to talk more about that would just step out into an aisle and come and take me by the hand. So we could visit about that more. Others here recognize, Father, that maybe they've not been reacting with the same level of compassion or commitment in their hearts, in their prayer lives, in their evangelistic life, in their sharing life, testifying life. Father, this recognize I, I haven't been doing, I haven't been doing what I need to be doing with my friends, my neighbors, my classmates, my family. So, Father, I pray that this morning will be a time of recommitment for them. Maybe some need to come and just kneel here at the, at the front as an altar of prayer, not only for their life, but also for the life of the church. That, Father, you would send this flock a shepherd who wants to join your mission and guide these people to be very involved with you in helping to see that throne room full in Revelation 5 and 7. So, Father, whatever the need is, I'm here to pray with folks. I'm here to greet and share with folks if, if necessary. Maybe there's someone here and they need to join this church. Father, there are leaders here who'd love to share with them about that. Maybe they need to be baptized. Never done that. They've never followed the Lord. Maybe that's the public commitment they need to make. I've trusted in Christ, but I've never been baptized. I need to do that. So whatever we need to do as we sing in just a moment, as our invitation song plays, that, Father, people would come and respond to you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's stand together. We're going to have a moment of invitation here. I'll be right here to pray with you and greet you in any way, and then I'm going to turn the service over, and we'll move on. But you come. Let's talk about trusting in Christ, joining the church, baptism. Maybe you just want to come and pray for your next pastor. Whatever you need to do, you come right now as we sing. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and walk. Every breath we could ever breathe, 
we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love. about building our life upon his love building our life upon this foundation let's sing that just one more time and then we'll close this service out but the invitation never stops you come see me after the service if you want to visit but let's sing that one more time and then we'll close build my life upon your love it is a just don't matter nearly as much as what we have had presented to us this morning. God, I thank you for Dr. Ewart and for his Lord, detailed explanation of how deep you love us, Lord, and, and that uh, regardless of where we live and who we are and what our last name is, Lord, you love each of us the same. Lord, you have such a desire and passion, Lord, to see all souls come to repentance. Lord, I thank you that you love us with such a deep love. Lord, and I pray that as we go out this week, Lord, that we will be changed. Lord, that we will spend time, Lord, um, 
submitting ourselves to you, surrendering ourselves to you, Lord, and uh, Lord, just being willing to do where, whatever you call us to do in wherever place that may be. Lord, I pray that you will keep us safe this week and provide many opportunities for us to be faithful to you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.